Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, let me first mention that Nick is actually one of my co-conspirator in this project that we started a little more than three years ago, so it's my great pleasure to talk about it. And I would like to highlight this is really uh, the work of three very talented graduate students and postdoc, Xiaofei, Li Ming, and Amador, who have made this work possible. So uh, before I start the work, let me just introduce myself briefly. Uh, in my group, we're looking at very basic electrochemical process, uh, such as ion insertion in batteries, fuel cells, and solar fuel process. And our approach is to establish design rules and rational engineering principle uh, for these devices. So I don't think I need to tell this audience the importance of making carbon neutral energy available when and where it's needed. And this is just a picture showing you why this must be the case. And over the past few decades, there's really been a lot of progress made on how to use photoelectrochemical devices to enhance the utilization of solar energy, and particularly to convert it uh, to chemical fuel by, for example, dissociating water into hydrogen and oxygen. And the biggest challenge in this process is really about using the entire solar spectrum. So if you look at the solar spectrum, you have ultraviolet, visible, and infrared. And often, what happens is you're able to capture part of the spectrum, but not all. And what happens to the part of the spectrum that is not captured often ends up as heat. And in many of the current uh, photoelectrochemical and solar cell processes, the heat is discarded and not utilized further. So the basic question we ask in this GSET project is, can we use the thermal energy to help us improve the performance of solar field process? And very briefly, in a photoelectrochemical cell, you have a material that typically absorbs light, converts uh, them into electron hole pairs, which then react with redox processes uh, in liquid, uh, typically uh, uh, in a water-based solution. So this is just a picture showing you what might be possible. Can we make earth abundant material like iron-based oxides and combine that with thermal energy to make the process more efficient? And one of the initial idea we had was to look at how transport properties of semiconductor depend on temperature. So as it turns out, um, many of these oxides, which are earth abundant, also have very low charge carrier mobility, which means it's hard to take the electrons or holes out of the material without them recombining and thereby converting them into heat. And this is just a, a plot of the mobility comparing silicon and iron oxide. And as you can see in silicon, the mobility is largely independent of temperatures, very high, about uh, 100 centimeters squared per volt per second. But for iron oxide, it's immeasurable at room temperature. And with increasing temperature, you slowly climb up, but you need to go to several hundred degrees Celsius. It turns out that this is a very general phenomena in metal oxides uh, because the d orbitals in oxides, especially in the transition metal oxides, are typically very narrow, so this gives rise to quick, uh, rather low electromobility, and this really limits the performance of this material. So the idea was, well, can we turn some of these oxides into better performing oxides by cranking up the temperature a little bit? And the temperature here would, in principle, come from the inefficient absorption of sunlight, and then, rather than throwing that away or by cooling the process, we simply turn that into uh, uh, activation energy to overcome some of the uh, limiting process in the cells. So about three years ago, we started with iron oxide that is substituted with titanium, and we're trying to here perform the oxygen evolution reaction. So this is the typical type of plots we have. We have uh, a current density as the y-axis and the potential as the x-axis, and what you want, it is a voltage curve which shifts to the uh, left as you turn the light as much as possible. So this is just one curve showing you at 25 degrees Celsius what that looks like. And then on the dashed line is what happens without the light. So the difference uh, corresponds to uh, the energy that is generated by absorbing light. So you can see in the dark, uh, you have a quite high onset potential. So the current takes off a very high potential. When you turn on the light, the potential shifts by about 700 uh, millivolt. Uh, and this is very nice. So what we want to happen as we turn on the heat to up the temperature, we want the curve to shift further 
um, to the left, but instead what we see is as we crank up the temperature, the curve is actually shifting to the right, which means that the driving force is decreasing. So this is, was a bit uh, uh, disappointing, and moreover, if you look at what is called the saturation photocurrent, it is also not changing with temperature either. So this was rather disappointing, but there was one uh, hope that if we look at the dark current, so this is how well the material behaved at, uh, without the light, you can see it is shifting in the right direction, meaning that potentially the catalysis is getting a little bit easier as you crank up the temperature. So we were thinking about why this was the case. So we went back to uh, a simple uh, electrochemistry and looked at how the carriers are being generated in the material. So it turns out that in the material that we're looking at, the activity at the surface, the efficiency for the material to extract the carriers into the solution is actually quite slow. So all the benefit you get from enhancing uh, with temperature may just get eaten up by recombination process at the interface. So to remove this effect, um, this was a, actually a suggestion from Nate a number of years ago, is to just look at a fast redox couple replacing uh, water um, redox couple with just a sulfite couple. So this is a very quick uh, redox couple, allow you to extract the carrier. Uh, it's as if you have a perfect catalyst on the surface without having to have one. And the results were very encouraging. Once we replaced the water oxidation reaction with the sulfite oxidation reaction, as you can see here in the top right, then the current began to increase with the temperature. So the blue line is at seven degrees Celsius and the red line at 72 degrees Celsius. You can see the current is slowly climbing. The voltage uh, is still shifting a little bit, but uh, it is much better than the previous case. And on the plot on the, on the bottom, I'm showing you how much the current is enhanced over room temperature. So without um, the sulfite fast redox couple uh, to scavenge uh, the hole that is being generated, you have a very, very flat line that's what's in black. But when you put sulfite, then the curve goes up quite a bit and the coefficient we're getting is about 1% per Kelvin. So every degree you turn up, the photocurrent increases by 1%. This was good, but not great. We were predicting something much larger, on the order about 5%. So we asked the question, what is going on here? And we come up with a, a simple picture, which I will come back to in a little bit. There are two regions in the material in which you can perform the uh, separation of the electrons and holes as the light is absorbed by the semiconductor. One region is assisted by the electric field. This is known as a space charge. So this is the region here denoted by W naught. And there's a second region in which the charge separation is facilitated by the diffusion of the carrier. So this is driven by a concentration gradient of the charge carrier, and this is known as the minority carrier diffusion region. So it turns out for a material like iron oxide, the two layers are comparable in thickness, a few nanometer for the space charge region and a few nanometer for the minority carrier diffusion length. And it turns out that the space charge region is not strongly activated by temperature because the mobility really governs how thick the minority carrier diffusion length and it only changes the space charge region negligibly. So the second idea we had was, well, can we increase the minority carrier diffusion length so that we can absorb more light in the region in which the temperature enhancement will be more noticeable. So we switched to a different material. This is bismuth venidate uh, that is doped with molybdenum. And this is the type of nanostructure that we have been able to create uh, by a combination of electrodeposition and annealing. And uh, let me just point out, the minority carrier diffusion length here is much larger than iron oxide. So it's two to four nanometer for iron oxide and about 70 to 100 nanometer in bismuth vanadate. Uh, the space charge region is comparably thick in both, is on the order of a few to 10 nanometer. Uh, and this is resulting from the high doping level that we have to do in order to get enough majority carrier mobility. And the results were even more encouraging. So these are showing the IV curves uh, with and without light. So without light is the black dash curve, with the light are blue uh, going to red. As we increase the temperature just by 32 degrees Celsius, we're able to increase the saturation photocurrent density from about two milliamp per centimeter square to almost uh, 3.5. So if I plot this um, and I show you the coefficients, now we're up to about 4% uh, per Kelvin and the shift in the voltage, it's only about two millivolt per Kelvin. So this is a really uh, impressive performance because the loss in the voltage is relatively small compared to the gain in the current. So on the net basis, you're getting more photo power out of this system. And if I compare this 
to the iron oxide example I have on the previous slide, we have a, almost a flat line showing that 1% behavior in iron oxide, but in the red line I showed the bismuth venidate is now up to 4%. So here we're really seeing a very dramatic enhancement by temperature simply by having more of the light being absorbed in the minority carrier diffusion length rather than in the space charge region. So we took advantage of this and we created a, a, a a bismuth venidate cell that is coupled with a silicon tin oxide junction, so this is essentially embedding a photovoltaic into the system. On the left, you can see a cross-sectional view with bismuth venidate on the top. We have an ohmic contact layer tin oxide in between, which is also transparent, and then we have n-type silicon as a substrate. The reason why we added the silicon is if you notice on the previous slide, we were losing voltage about two millivolt per Kelvin, so it'd be good to offset that. So by adding a silicon solar cell embedded in our photoelectrochemical um, electrode, then we're able to push the voltage further to the left, which is what you desire. We're able to add about 300 millivolt additionally to the system, and by comparing against other type of uh, bismuth venidate based cell, we're able to achieve a very low onset potential and also a very high current density, and this is by combining both managing the voltage and also enhancing the current uh, with temperature. So this was a very nice demonstration showing that temperature and thermal energy can actually be a viable tool for tuning the performance of devices and elevating the temperature will give you a net improvement in performance rather than a decrease which is commonly uh, observed in solar cells. So the next experiment we thought was well should understand what's going on and can we validate the model I proposed in the competition of light absorption between the space charge region and in the minority carrier diffusion region. What we did now was to look at a third material, titanium oxide. And this is a very well established model system for studying photoelectrochemistry. The performance is typically not very good because of the large band gap, but nevertheless, we're able to see what is going on. So what we have done here, it is to make nanowires of titanium dioxide so we can control the diameters and the distances and the relative transport length more accurately. This is just one of those uh, nanowires you can see in the cross-sectional image there. We're showing you again the improvement in the photocurrent as a function of temperature. Uh, the increases is okay, it's on the order about 1% per Kelvin, so typical, uh, uh, comparable to the iron oxide case. And what we have done here, it is to use the controllability of the synthesis by varying the diameter of the wire. So as you increase the diameter of the wire, the region which is occupied by the minority carrier diffusion length is actually getting smaller and smaller. As you increase the temperature for the smaller wires, eventually you'll run out of enhancement because you would have eventually activated entire wire by increasing the minority carrier diffusion length. But for the larger wire, you will tend to have still a very much inactive core. So simply by using geometry, varying temperature and the wire diameter at the same time, we can try to test our theory that it is the light absorption competition between the space charge region and in the minority carrier diffusion region that's controlling the performance. And this is just to show you that we have fabricated three different diameter nanowire, and to convince you that the surface of these nanowires are the same, we carried out high resolution imaging on the electron microscope just to confirm that the termination layer where the titania intersects with the liquid are in fact the same. So the difference between the three wires are only the diameter, okay? And what I'm about to show you, it is a data set that looks at the photocurrent as a function of temperature for each diameter. And what we have done here, it is to develop a simple geometric model to fit all the data points for all the sample using one equation. So you can see when the wire is very, very thick, such as the green line over there, it's very much increasing linearly with temperature. So that means as you increase the temperature, you're getting more and more current because you're not running out of wire to absorb the light. But when you have a very small wire, eventually you are activating the entire wire through thermal activation of the minority carrier diffusion length. That's why the blue line tends to plateau. And our model perfectly captures this transition from a linear behavior to a more plateau behavior and from this data set, which took three samples and about a day to measure, we're actually able to back out the minority carrier diffusion length, the activation energy of minority carrier transport, and also the space charger layer width by using the equation I have down there, just by considering the geometry, the diameter of the wire, the thickness of the space charge region, 
and the thickness of the minority carrier diffusion. There's a lot of assumption, but we are very happy that such a simple model can explain the data accurately. And this is a plot showing you how temperature is activating the minority carrier diffusion length from about six nanometer at 10 degrees Celsius to 12 nanometer at 70 degrees Celsius. And we're also able to extract a space charge layer width of nine nanometers, which is very uh, comparable to what's expected for this substitution level in titania. And we're able, also able to back out an activation energy of 0.1 electron volt, which is consistent uh, with the type of electron trapping that you see in titania. So it turns out that the fraction of light collected within the minority carrier diffusion length is what's dictating the thermal enhancement. And here we provide a very unified view of temperature enhancement. This plot shows the performance or the extent of temperature enhancement uh, as a function of the space charge layer width and also the minority carrier diffusion length. And you can see why iron oxide didn't work very well to begin with. The dashed line shows where it is equal. So this is same uh, diffusion length uh, as the space charge layer. Iron oxide sits pretty much uh, on the line. So that gives you a fairly low enhancement. Titania sits a little bit further to the right, which is good. That means more light is absorbed in the region that can be activated by heat. But bismuth venidate sits far to the right because the minority carrier diffusion length is much longer than the space charge layer width. And this is consistent with our experimental observation that we have minimum enhancement for iron oxide, a little bit better enhancement for titania, and much better enhancement for bismuth venidate. And for the last part of my talk, I want to discuss how to go above 100 degrees Celsius. So if you don't pressurize the water, basically they will boil at about 100 degrees Celsius. And we see that there is a benefit to temperature enhancement. And the next question we ask is, can we get more out of it by going above 100 C? So we needed to replace the water with a solid state electrolyte. And what we've developed here is an all oxide approach and replacing water with an oxide based uh, solid electrolyte. And this is the type of cell that we have prepared. Uh, my student Madur has been working very hard over the past few years to make this happen. We're using as a demonstration system, uh, yttria stabilized zirconia as an oxygen ion conductor. We fabricated a very thin membrane on the order of a few hundred nanometer, which is supported on a silicon substrate, but this is uh, not uh, photoactive in this particular setting. The uh, scanning electron microscope images uh, and the chemical map below shows you the cell from the top. What we have done here is we needed to add one more ionic conductor. So if you just put something like bismuth venidate on zirconia, then only the intersection between the two will be active. That's where you can extract the, uh, the photocarrier. But it will be good to surround the bismuth venidate with something like water, something that can also help you transport the ions. And that's what we have done here. We add it in addition to the material that absorbs light, a material that also transport ion as well. And this, we also use a bismuth-based material for compatibility. So we're using here bismuth copper vanadium oxide, which is an excellent ionic conductor. We mix that in uh, with the bismuth venidate. You can see here in the color images, uh, the red images here shows you the distribution of copper, which is not present in bismuth venidate. And by mixing the two at the boundary of this interfaces, you have the electron hole pair coming from the bismuth venidate, you have the oxygen ion as your mobile carrier in the bismuth copper vanadium oxide, and you have the whole thing on a solid state electrolyte. So we examine this system as a function of temperature, just like the bismuth venidate in water. So here it's a plot on the left of the photovoltage as a function of temperature. The blue shows you the liquid system, so you can see there's a slight slope. The photovoltage decreases. So we extrapolated that all the way down to about 400 C, and this is where the photovoltage would go to zero. And this is just from the uh, uh, expectation that the material is becoming more intrinsic, so you're losing your junction at the interface. The red curve shows the cell. So it closed up from almost zero voltage at low temperature because the ions are not mobile, but as increase the temperature, the voltage voltage actually goes up. So this is opposite that of the liquid system. And this is one demonstration that you can actually use a ionic carrier in a solid as a way to facilitate charge separation. We've also done experiment where we took out various components of our electrode. It's only when you have both bismuth venidate and the bismuth copper venidate, then you will get an excellent photo voltage. On the right here, I'm showing the current density uh, with and without light, and you can see that we're getting quite an appreciable photocurrent 
uh, we're now able to reach almost 100 milliamp per square centimeter, and our goal, which I keep increasing, is now 1,000 milliamp per cent, uh, square centimeter. Uh, so this system has the advantage of high current, but low voltage. So this is something we're trying to understand how we can make use of it. Uh, certainly increasing the junctions uh, in the system or by combining with other processes or external bias, this can become a useful approach. So to conclude, let me just show you the following schematics on how we think about thermally enhancing the generation of solar fields. In the conventional um, world, we're looking at solar cells and PEC, we're taking light and we're shining on it and we're getting solar fields or electricity out of it. If we're able to concentrate the light as it is sometimes done in concentrated photovoltaics, we often have to cool the system in order to prevent the uh, degradation of the performance. But as shown in this work, it may be helpful to consider how the heat can actually benefit carrier transport and catalysis in certain systems. And then we can propose something maybe without the cooling. And then we can take advantage of the heat that is being generated. And with that, I would like to thank you very much for your attention. Questions? Shan Hui. Thank you. Um, so uh, I meant to ask, many of the structural modification that you do uh, will significantly influence the optical absorption properties as well. Uh, so have you uh, tried to exploit that possibilities for uh, design of your system? Yeah, Nick and I have been thinking that from day one, but it has taken us longer than we thought to get to this point, so that we'll have to uh, uh, raise more resources to tackle that challenge. Great. Nate. Thanks, it was uh, really good. Um, the voltage in solar cells goes down two millivolts a degree, like we predicted it was gonna do. Uh, so you're getting more current, eventually you'll get a lot of current, but these high temperature cells um, fundamentally, but one can learn what the recombination mechanism actually is by looking at that temperature dependence in that high current limit uh, when you keep constant current and then don't have the confounding effects of more current giving you more photovoltage when you should be getting less. So have you deconvoluted all that and does it make sense that you want to run these at high temperature while just inherently having more recombination and losing voltage? Or do you really want to cool them and use the heat for something else? Yeah. Well, actually, Nate, so from the photovoltage dependence on temperature, uh, our current understanding is that actually it is dominated more by the loss of uh, Fermi level splitting as opposed to the dependence of, temp uh, dependence of recombination on temperature. And I absolutely agree with you that for the high temperature case, the photovoltage is falling too much. So basically, intersection point is not optimal right now. So for the liquid cells, that's actually much more advantageous because in that region, there is actually a peak photo power that lies above ambient. But for the solid state approach right now, because the photo voltage is falling too quickly, so where the photo current is picking up, it's already beneath um, the optimal photo power output. So the two approaches we're considering right now is one, can we envision this as more as a light enhancement of electrolysis cell rather than just having a standalone PEC? Two, uh, then can we think about ways to try to improve the photo voltage so that moves the voltage up? But you're absolutely right that I think for the liquid case, there is a much better case for increasing the temperature slightly above ambient to get peak photo power. But for the solid state, for right now, uh, at 300 degrees Celsius, we're above the peak power. So if we can find an ionic conductor that can go down to 150 or 200 degrees Celsius with a suitable photo current, then we're talking. Yeah. Thank you, Dan. Other questions? Well, maybe I can ask one. On our own work, it is always an interesting thing to do. Um, <clears throat> so what, one of the things that comes up often is where is the heat going to come from, right? So if we do want to go to these higher temperatures, are you going to have to have a photocell plus heat? Do you have enough heat from the solar spectrum to do these kind of processes? Well, for the high temperature variance, certainly uh, some degree of concentration will be needed, and of course, uh, spectral selectivity will help with that. The low temperature, I'm not too concerned. To get up to 80 degrees Celsius is fairly straightforward, simply by absorbing some of the IR passing through. So I think in the former cases, we're talking about almost a costless improvement uh, to performance. In the second case, we have to rigorously consider 
all the costs associated with increasing the concentration to get the temperature you want. But even just with a few, say, 10 sun concentration, you should be able to get to 300C with good uh, spectral selectivity uh, for the cells. Yeah. Great. Any other questions? If not, let's thank Will again. Okay. Thank you.